What's going on, everyone? You're listening to the Asian MMA Podcast, where we talk about everything and anything going on in the world of Asian MMA. This episode is brought to you by Five Second Knockouts, and we'll talk about why in a minute. <laughs> now, this is a special episode. This is actually my first guest coming on. So I've got Javier Truello. Truello? Uh, Trujillo. Trujillo. I'm not Mexican, so I can't say it. It's all right, man. Trujillo, Trujillo. It's <laughs> you okay. know, my, my last name's Bluey, and I'm sure we've gone through the same things our whole lives. Yeah, right? yeah man, no worries. <laughs> but, uh, man, Javi, man, thank you for uh, coming by. Yeah, brother, thank you for having me, man. So if you guys don't know, I don't even know why you're listening to my podcast if you don't know who Javi is, but he is a staple on the scene for Asian MMA the past couple of years. Essentially, stand out in Full Metal Dojo, but I know you're looking to expand that reach a bit. Yeah, yeah. Like, um, especially after coming off a win, this last FMD, I'm, I'm really trying to look to get signed by one of these bigger organizations. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I can argue that, hey, like, I'm one of the most exciting fighters, I think, in, in the Asian MMA scene. For sure. Uh, three first round finishes and a five second knockout. If you guys haven't seen the video of Javi, I, I actually shared the link before when I did the preview of FMD of you knocking out uh, Ryan Federin. Is that his name? I think Feltner. Is Feltner. His name. Yeah. Uh, five second knockout. Just one of the most amazing knockouts I've ever seen. <laughs> but then what makes the video even better is Jason Mayhem Miller is the commentator. Oh, my and God. And he just starts this <laughs> maniacal laugh as soon as you hit. It is like Ryan ran his fist, his face into your fist. Yeah. Yeah, dude. I mean, it was funny. I remember talking to Jason afterwards and he's like, yeah, it was just like, you guys were like super like intense, you know, looking at each other. It was like some like, you know, this is right when the Trump thing happens. So he's just like, man, it's just like this redneck boy going against this Mexican guy, dude. It was just like epic, you know, like making MMA great again. That's why I wanted to say that. You know know what's (laughs) crazy is I remember him walking out for that fight. And he's, like, looking at you, like, flipping you off. He's, like, doing the thumb across yeah. the throat. I'm like, man, this guy's confident. He's, he's got it. You know, he's, he's doing something. Yeah, man. And then uh, it was funny because you know how, how all the FMDs are set up. Like, you, I mean, that was at the old Insanity. But so there was a little bit yeah. more space. So we didn't quite see the your, your opponent. But I remember, you know, Nick Lee, right? Yeah. He was in the other corner, and he'd run over. And he's like, bro, this guy is just talking mad shit about you, dude. He wants to do it. <laughs> <laughs> this guy really wants to mess you up, man. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny because, you know, when you think about that fight, like, I, I don't think anyone, especially not in Asia, really knew who he was beforehand. No. And I think that was, what, your third fight or second my fight? Second, my second pro fight. So, yeah. like, you were still kind of, like, people from Bangkok knew you, but I would say over Asia, like, you weren't really well known. No. And then that was, I want to say that was the either the next to last or third from last fight on that card. And it was just bang. Like, no, nothing was going to top that that night. No, man, that was that was an epic, uh, epic, epic moment for sure in MMA, <laughs> man. I mean, what's crazy about that, too, is like, uh, I mean, being a jujitsu guy, that's the last thing you're ever going to expect <laughs> yeah. to KO a guy in like five seconds. Everybody was, be- all my buddies were betting is like, bro, we all thought you were going to submit him in like the first round at some point. Right? Yeah. And then just like everybody lost money, man. So yeah. thanks. <laughs> you, you, had, you had a more chance of hitting like a flying arm bar than you yeah. did a knockout, yeah, right? Yeah, I was just not expecting that at all. But I was like, hey, it's not too bad for a grappler, you know, be up there with uh, Conor McGregor and... What Dwayne Ludwig and yeah. all those top guys? So, ah, that's cool. <laughs> now you just had you had a pretty hard fought win at the most recent FMD. Yeah, and uh, I think a lot of people, you know, you look at that fight and you're fighting uh, Vinat, who is coming off of his amateur career, so it's his pro debut. But a lot of people don't understand the depth that his amateur career actually went to because he's been through the MEMA tournament a few times and fought some guys who have gone on to a lot of success. So that was, you know, a pretty tough fight in general. He's done really well in me. I thought matchup wise, I thought that was probably one of the closer fights I've ever had. Yeah. Honestly, I was more nervous for that one than the, the Kerr fight. Yeah. To and, be quite honest. Yeah, you know, I'll tell you that. I thought, you know, I was I, I, I said in my preview that I thought that was gonna be a tough fight for him. Cause you're not the guy that I would wanna make my pro debut but, yeah. against, you know. And then going yeah. up a weight class. So kudos yeah. to him, dude. There was that straight balls. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. No. And I know now you know FMD essentially is done, right? For the yeah. most part, what I mean, they, what they're saying they want to do at least an annual event or something it's like tough that. Tough to pull off one a year. Yeah, which yeah. is which is sad. Yeah, it's sad, but you know I understand from a business perspective they gotta they gotta look at the market. Yeah, and you know they they were gonna go for that kind of less edgy Kumite three thousand show, but that kind of leaves you out in the in the dark. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, that's why I'm trying to reach out and trying to get on as many podcasts and do as many yeah. interviews as I can because um, while the iron's still hot, man, yeah. I just want to want to 
I feel I've never felt this good. I feel better now than I did when in my early twenties. You came away injury free from the fight. Injury free. I mean, outside of like maybe maybe a foot injury, like but that healed up in a couple of days, and you okay. know. I'm feeling pretty good, man. You know? So you could turn around and fight for like a, a Risen or like a Risen. I, w- Dream. I was thinking yeah. Dream yeah. Road, any of those guys, man. Rebel, um, Bama, Rebel, yeah. anybody. So it's just like uh, ABC, I, a, uh, ACB, ACB. Yeah. I'll definitely fight for them as well. That'd be I. I mean, I I, I love Risen from just like the look, the production wise of just, it. Man, I, that was my dream when yeah. I when I wanted to do this when I was 15. All my favorite fights were watching Pride. Pride, right? Yeah, watching me too. Rampage, slamming dudes, watching Shogun do the freaking stomps to everybody. Like, who watching, was your favorite guy back in the Pride day? <sighs> man, dude, Shogun. Yeah. I love Shogun. Dude. Really, you're a Shogun <laughs> yeah, guy. I liked Shogun. I liked um, obviously Rampage at that time when he was fighting. I just thought he was, he was psycho, dude. Just dude, well, who was who was he fighting with with the triangle, dude? And he locks him up in triangle and just freaking body slam him. Was that that wasn't Shogun? No, it wasn't no. Shogun. It was another Brazilian guy. Yeah. He was really tough. I can't remember his name. Oh, right Ricardo Arona. There you go. Yeah, and he yeah. had him in the triangle, just slammed him and knocked him out dude, twice. <laughs> you know? I was like, dang. Did you ever see Rampage's first fight in King of the Cage with um, Marvin Eastman? No. Yeah, old school fight, and uh, like old old school, probably like a year before he even went to Pride. And it's funny because I think that was his pro debut. And, like, his interview afterwards, he's not, like, the character we know as Rampage today. Yeah. He's a completely different person. And I think a lot of that came from the Pride coaching. Like, Pride wanted a certain look. Pride wanted a certain, you know, je ne sais quoi about yeah. uh, their foreign fighters. Yeah, I mean, like, what, they made him walk, walk out with, like, the big uh, chain, chain link yeah, and, all and that howl. stuff. Yeah, just do all that crazy stuff. I mean, and then Mayhem. That's I, I was always watching Mayhem fight yep. on those cards and, and – uh, and the and Nick Nick Diaz, you yeah. know, just that's where I always wanted to fight. I just felt like Japan, and then like Hickson back yeah. in the, the original Pride days. Yeah, the like, Hickson days. Yeah, man, I always just wanted to share the stadium with yeah. all my heroes. Yeah, know? I was a, a huge Genki Sudo fan. Oh I yeah, loved dude. Genki Sudo, and not just for his walkouts. I mean, he's a great fighter and like very entertaining to watch. Yeah, yeah, man. Well, we were just talking before the podcast. We were talking about catch wrestling. Like, yeah. honestly, hands down, my favorite fighter of all time is Sakuraba. <laughs> for the sure, killer man. You know, pro wrestling, catch wrestling, yeah, just, dude. just craftiness background. Yeah. Yeah, and he I think he was still fighting like a few years ago. Yeah, I mean, well, he's just still doing those quintets right now. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, you know, all taped up like a mummy, probably smoking cigarettes still. Just <laughs> you like... remember when his air ripped off? Oh my god. Yeah. Dude. <laughs> that was that was one of the most gruesome things I'd ever seen up to that point. Man, those those were the days, dude. I miss, or, I miss those days. You remember when he <laughs> broke his shoulder fight in uh Wandele, Wandele? He did? I didn't know he broke his shoulder in yeah. that fight. It was like I think it was their first fight. Uh and remember they had the ten minute first round? Yes. And so he, he broke it. It looked like it broke during a soccer kick, like early in the first round. And uh in between the first uh when the first round ended, he sat up. And you could see the bone, like, not sticking out, but, like, poking through the skin. Oh. I'm going to look it up. And, (laughs) but yeah, I think it was the first fight. Yeah, man. And I miss that style of rule set because it's, like, uh, it did help out the grappler, at least for the first round, knowing that you have a 10-minute round like that. And you could still do an old jiu-jitsu strategy. Yeah. Like, that's that's what's kind of... Not that's what sucks about modern MMA, but all of the rule set does benefit the striker. Yeah. You know, it... Well... You see, like, one of the things that I like and dislike with uh, one championship is they're making the move to the ring. Right. And I think it makes it a little bit more palatable, especially for a wider audience in Asia, which is their target demographic, Mm. where cage fighting might still have a, a negative connotation. Where, you know, the ring makes it much more palatable. The difference is that it makes it a much striker friendly sport. Right. So. It, it, you're essentially taking the most dangerous techniques for long-term brain health in the sport and saying that, hey, our environment makes it so that these are what you should be doing. And, you know, it's tough to work. You obviously can't work the ropes like you can a cage. You can't hit takedowns with yeah, a, a lot of pressure. Be yeah, completely. Well, everybody has to get good at open takedowns again. Yeah, just yeah. shooting from the middle, you know, or, or luring someone into the middle then trying to hit a, a takedown from yeah. there. A lot, a lot of shoot box style. Yeah. A lot of pan craze style, type style, being able to punch and set up your takedowns. Yeah, I, and that's a, that's a good thing. I mean, it's a, you have to adapt to the environment that you're fighting in, but by the same token, someone from a grappling background, I really enjoy what the cage does to oh, the yeah. sport, technically. Yeah. 
you know, I like to watch guys work against the cage. I like to wa- watch them fighting for to either to get up or to secure a position, you know, against the cage. I think that makes it more interesting. I think so, too. I mean, I could also see why the ring would be palatable, too, because at least for the, the viewer, they can see a little bit better. Yeah. But uh, you know what? I wish it, I wish somebody would set up a, a promotion where, like, you fight in a pit. They had something like that where uh, it was a karate tournament. Yeah, well, uh, was it? Um, Boss Rutan was Rutan's, like the yeah. uh, announcer. It was also kind of like uh, Chuck Norris's before that. You ever seen that one as well? Uh, I don't know. Oh if man, I've seen what's Chuck. his name? Um, Uriah. Is it Uriah Hall? Is the, that the the, 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 the black, black guy, guy yeah, with a crazy back kick? Wheel kick? Yeah, yeah, he fought in that as well. And I remember watching him in that, and it, it was also a little dome. But okay. I'm thinking, like, why don't they just set up like where it's like a pit? And they have like the cage, like you. So, so the, at least from a viewer perspective, you kind of have like more of a lower view, like you can look into it. Yeah, that kind of makes it tough though, from to if you're watching it to, to really get a a good angle on on the viewing. You think so? Yeah, because at least with the cage, you can see through the cage. Right. So if they're in a pit and they're against the wall, unless it's like plexiglass. I mean, why not? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> lower them into a plexiglass pit or, or raise them up in a plexiglass enclosure. <laughs> yeah, dude. Oh, that'd be awesome. Like some WWE stuff. A karate combat organization, a uh, full contact fight league. Yeah. That's what it's called. And they, they fight in like a pit with like uh, angled walls. Oh, wow. I, I haven't seen that one yet. Yeah, so it's it's they go into a pit and it's like uh, the walls are angled like 45 degrees or something. It's interesting, man. And they can work off of that. Learn how to take the high ground. <laughs> yeah. yeah there you the, go. You know, talk about the showtime kick, right? Imagine yeah. running up the uh, the just, incline. Jesus, dude. And just like line in sight for like a roundhouse kick for a head kick. That's probably <laughs> brutal, dude. <laughs> brutal. It's, it's got to be <laughs> tough to film as well, though. Yeah. I don't know. Have you seen any of the shows? Yet? I, I've seen some on YouTube where they're, they're actually like... They're in the pit, but they're, the, the angles are a bit weird. I, I really only watch it because Boz Rutten was commentating, and he's hilarious. Yeah. And, like, sometimes you can tell he has no idea who the guy is coming out. And he's just like, yeah, I don't know who this guy is, but he looks tough. <laughs> I saw him warming up. Uh, <laughs> he looked pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> dude, that's, that's crazy, man. But, uh, but yeah, dude, uh, like, so, so we were talking about um, – so you you came from a cat wrestling background, huh? So yeah, when I when I first started getting into it, like I said, I didn't really do wrestling in high school. I didn't right. do folk wrestling. And then when I was living in North Carolina, I studied with a guy for a little bit doing catch wrestling, and no pedigree. Like you you were telling me, you studied under one of Sh- Frank Shamrock's guys. Yeah, it was just a dude who was teaching catch wrestling out in uh, in Carolina. And then I moved up to Rhode Island, and I started training at a guy who was doing. He had a system. There was like. Uh, what was it called? The uh, Brazilian Japanese American or American Brazilian Japanese Jiu Jitsu is what what he was teaching. It was essentially the same thing. It was catch wrestling. Yeah. So it was a lot more like uh, a lot of that folk style type of riding and takedowns with a lot more of like very rudimentary basic Japanese submissions. But right. then you would chain them the same way you chain, chain submissions in folk style. And yeah. well, that you do in catch too. You yeah. start training and getting a flow going. Yeah, exactly, and that's what I, I think. Um, when I when I decided to start studying Tenth Planet stuff, it's very yeah. similar, and then kind of starting to figure out that half of the Tenth Planet system is folk style wrestling. Is it really? Well, if you think about it, the truck is just leg riding. You're yeah. trying to ride for points, and once I figured that out, I was like, oh, it's just a wrestler's guillotine is a twister. All yeah. right. You know, freaking calf cranks. That's, that's all it is. It's just submission wrestling, catch wrestling. And they and train the, completely no gi at Tenth Planet, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the, and why I started started a like becoming i guess like a 10th planet ronin because at the time there was no 10th planet schools where i was at okay um like how that got started was my my friend glenn cordoza so like well, where were you you were in cali at the i was time? in i was in i was in chico in california at the time where, where's took, that um it's like two hours north of sacramento it's like a also oh, you're in the middle of the state yeah it's a it's um it's a college town it's okay. like a big state university it used to be like a huge party school back in the day all right but um, surprisingly, yeah. nobody knows about that place is that, like, that's where CrossFit was first, like, discovered or, really? or became a thing. Yeah, Northwest CrossFit. I'm not sure if this is a good or a bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, Rob Wolf, well, was, and then Rob Wolf, who, who came up with the paleo diet. So, like, all that whole thing came from that area. And um, 
also right outside there is Susanville, and that's where the Shamrocks had their their gym, the oh, okay. original Lions Den. Oh, is that where it was? Yeah, oh. yeah, a little town called Susanville. I used to live up in Monterey for oh, about, nice. a, about a year or so. Yeah, yeah, yeah just dude. south of the valley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no cow still. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but but um, uh, my friend Glenn, he's like a he's a new uh, like a New York best time sell, selling author. He, he nice. wrote this book called um, Becoming a Supple Leopard with Kelly Starrett. I don't becoming know a supple leopard yeah yeah it's all about all that foam rolling stuff all the stuff with the lacrosse balls that's all their concepts and their ideas okay. and, and everything like that but he also wrote all of uh eddie bravo's instructional manuals so like title publishing which is the or victory they all those books you think fedor elaminko bj penn uh randy couture all those all those books back in the day before youtube was popular that's how everybody was getting their information i remember i used to get some of the uh bjj uh instructional books and yeah you know beautiful books they'd be like all uh like high gloss i miss them, edge edge. I miss them. Uh, yeah yeah, yeah that, that was like before the youtube days and then yeah. like when when i was in high school and i wanted to know this is what i would do that was the only way i was getting info yeah and then next thing you know i'm friends with the guy who writes all the books Nice. And he told me when he's when I was an amateur, he gave me the, the Mastering the Rubber Guard books. And he's like, bro, if you want to be a grappler and stay relevant in MMA, you got to understand the Ted Planet system. Uh, I, I like it. I, li- I mean, I, you can't argue with the results that Eddie Bravo has definitely accomplished in, yeah. in jiu-jitsu and his students have accomplished, which speaks, I think, more to actually what he's – than what he's accomplished mm-hmm. is that his students have gone on to have a lot of success. I don't know. I just don't think my joints have the flexibility for that system. Yeah, man. I mean, even with like the rubber guard system, I'm not the most flexible guy in the world, but um, there are ways to modify it. Yeah. There are ways. And it's just taking deeper angles, you know, it's just, yeah. just being able to shift your hips a little bit more. Yeah, I remember when Eddie tapped uh, Hoyler. Yeah, that was and huge. That, yeah. It was a ground shed, mo- like a watershed moment in jujitsu. Oh, yeah, man. I mean, well, I think, I, don't know, I can't even remember if it was like the first American or if it was like, I forget what exactly it is, but. I mean, being the first guy to tap a Gracie, that's, yeah. that's huge, crazy, huge. It's huge. And a Mexican descent. <laughs> is he? So is he of Mexican yeah. descent? Yeah, dude, he's Mexican-American, man. So Bravo's not his real name? Eddie Bravo? Yeah, I believe so. I believe yeah. it's his real name. Yeah, but, uh, um, yeah, so I just kind of became a fan of it after that. And, honestly, in my amateur career, it mm. saved me a lot of times from getting my ass whooped on bottom. Yeah. You know, it really, it really stops from taking damage, you know? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you can see the defensive benefits of, yeah. of that system. But it's, it's I, I think it's uh, deceptively offensive. Oh, absolutely. You know, while being defensive as when, well. When you see, like, these high-level guys, when I, I got an opportunity to train over at headquarters yeah. last December with a uh, um, got to stay with, you know, you know Ricardo. Right? Yeah. Yeah, he let me stay at his place. And nice. he's, like, 15 minutes down from HQ. So I just oh. go every day and just to see that, oh, man, there are levels to this game. And you see yeah. the, his high-level black belts, man, just just snapping on these rubber guards. Or, or everybody. What, what I like about it, too, is that 10th Planet, they, they, there is a curriculum, but mm. nobody's cookie cutter. Like, it's like we have the template, but then everybody has their own unique style to it. You okay. know, like Nathan Orchard's style is way different than Marvin Castell's style. Mm. Marvin Castell's style is way different than... You know Jeremiah. There's definitely a lot of creative guys coming out of Temple. Yeah, right? and I, and what I like about it is that it's a non-dogmatic approach to jujitsu. Mm. You know, there if 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 it works, they incorporate it, and that's what I always like about any any system. Mm. You know. So when you're training at the headquarters, it's what in West Hollywood, right? It's uh, downtown Los Angeles. Downtown LA. Yeah. So when you're training there. Right. What what does the roster of guys running through there look like? Are Man. you just are you just rolling with guys who are gonna murk you like every five seconds? I mean, well, yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I felt it gave me definitely a confidence boost, especially after losing to, to Medi mm. and then getting choked. Yeah, like you know, be feeling I'd be a proud jujitsu guy to happen to submit. It, yeah, you know, it doesn't help out the ego, but going there and everybody that was at my level, I can hang with. Yeah. You know, but at the time they had no gi worlds in Los Angeles, okay. so everybody who was good was in that gym nice you had guys all from europe and japan and this and that and i just saw wow there there are definitely levels Mm. to to this game that medi fight that was what a year a year and a half ago a year year ago ago from that fight man so a full year that was your first loss as a pro yeah and you know what 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 was that like for you walking away from that uh i was disappointed in myself i mean I'm not making any excuses, but I had a lot going on outside. Yeah. Outside of that, I, uh, um, I was a separation from my girlfriend at the time. Mm. We were supposed to get married and this and that. So I had a lot of, 
lot of issues dealing with and and with the transition of fight lab from its old location to the new location we didn't really have any of the equipment nor all most of, most of the teammates all either left but down to phuket or they went somewhere else yeah. until the gym was completed and um i, I felt if i had probably had a proper camp maybe that would have gone different hell maybe if i didn't break his cup it would have been a little <laughs> right. bit different you know i mean he got a 10 minute break and got his win back yeah but um did you know who Medi was going into that fight? No, I just knew that he was a good wrestler. Yeah. Well, I felt confident. I mean, I didn't get out wrestled by him. Yeah. You know, you and know? That, that's true. You didn't. And uh, one of the things that I think was interesting was that, you know, in Bangkok, no one really knew Medi. He was kind of like at the same point you were up yeah. until the Ryan fight where that knockout kind of propelled you. He'd only fought in, in Malaysia in like really, really small shows like Ultimate Beatdown and stuff like that. Yeah. So – if you hadn't spent time in the Malaysian scene, a lot of people didn't know who he was and what his pedigree was. Yeah, and he's. We we saw his fight with uh, Glenn Sparv last which I thought last he did, week. Yeah, which he did he really did very, well. Very good that yeah. first round. You know, I was very surprised by his striking. Yeah, so yeah. he was snapping Glenn's head back at yeah. times, and he, he was pushing the pace against Glenn, who was clearly like <laughs> looked like a heavyweight. Dude, he looked. Huge. Dude, um, I saw him at the weigh-ins, and he just like he looked like a raisin, bro. He's yeah. just like shrunk <laughs> up, and I was like, damn, man. And then yeah, seeing him the next day is like, whoa, bro. It's like, <laughs> yeah, he, I, I, like if, a master of weight cutting. If, if he was a, if he was under a hundred kg, I would be surprised. I would have been surprised too, man. He looked like he was Huge. like hundred plus. They, sure. they weighed in, they each weighed in at eighty four. Yeah, and I'm like, what? there's what? no way. Dude. Yeah. How, yeah. how is that physically possible? <laughs> there's no way, man. He, but you can tell, you can tell. Like I mean, what he was nine, he's nineteen and five. That's yeah. that's a sign of a true veteran. Twenty you know, you and five make, now, yeah. Yeah, I mean. To make a weight cut like that and then come back the next day and look like you weren't yeah. even, even phased, dude. How it's much just, do you cut to get down? To 77, I would cut down probably about 5 kgs, 5 to 6 kgs. That's not a bad cut. No, no. It's actually pretty easy, and, and uh, I wanted to make it as a, I'm actually walking around lighter these days than I, I previously used to do. Okay. I used to probably walk around around 90 kgs to 95 kgs and make the cut down to 77 then. That's a big cut. That's a big cut. You know, but coming from a wrestling background, you know, I'm used, used to, that. to that. Yeah, yeah, but um, I told myself last year, even with the Medi fight, that whole year is like I, I was very active. You know, mm. I had the Feltner fight, I had yeah. the the previous fight as well for FMD, and I competed actively in jujitsu. Yeah, and I wanted to just maintain a lower weight, just because if that opportunity for a big organization was there, like, hey, we have three weeks to get, to get ready for this fight. Can you do it? I wanted to be prepared to make a drop to 77. And so not. you're walking around like 80, 82 right now, right now, 80, 82. Nice. Yeah. And, um, so that's, you could like, even on like, cause you're always training too, cause you run the fight team at elite. Yeah. So you got to at least be in like a, a decent baseline of conditioning. Yeah. Always. So you could make a cut in like on a week's notice. Exactly. You know, I could definitely make the cut. No problem. In 77. So risen calls you and they're like, Hey, we need you in Japan next week I for a fight at 77. Yeah. Boom done yeah especially right now i still feel fresh man i can go i can right my last hard sparring day i did seven rounds and i felt good right. by the seventh round you know so I'm now, when you go hard sparring you're talking about like actual heart heavy contact or heavy just contact. hard cardio heavy contact okay. just once a week though um okay. we used to do twice a week and i feel like that's too much and mm. i felt like i took a little too much damage and i mean this is my 10th year training mma mm. I know I'm tough. I don't need mm. to get beat up like that no more. Mm. You know, I think once a week is enough, and I just do a lot of pad work. Yeah, a lot of pad work. That's how a lot of the Muay Thai guys do it. They they do heavy pads heavy. all the time. Well, they they do a lot of body work too. They yeah. knee in each other in the body, kicks, punches. And then, but they let it off a little bit enough yeah. to condition the body to prepare for them, but yeah. not like trying to murder each other. You know, and that's definitely what like living and training here in Thailand. I have yeah. picked up from the Thais that like, man, dude, why? Why, why break down the body, you know, dude? Yeah. I mean, you need that for... for well, they also... A lot of those guys fight twice a week twi sometimes. Exactly. Like, you know? <laughs> but that's the same mentality I think a lot of MMA guys got to start looking at it like, too. Because if you want that big opportunity, yeah, it's going to be on a two- or three-week day notice. And if you're broken... Yeah, you true. Know, you get paid to make it to the show. You don't get paid for to get busted up in the gym. Very you true. Know? Now, you miss the fight, you miss the payday. Exactly. You know, you know and... Yeah, I I saw that you had a huge uh, you had a huge following at the uh, the last FMD. A lot of guys showed out for you. Is that mostly the uh, elite guys, or like wh no, where, where's your following man. coming from? I mean, from elite, from Fight Lab. Yeah. Still, you know, I got a lot of a lot of people there that support me, and just the community, man. Like yeah. I meet a lot of people. I'm out and about. Not like 
you know, and, and, and a lot of people support me. They like my story and what I do, and, and it's just cool, man. Was it a tough transition from Fight Lab over to Elite, or was like their, be, their kind of transition of moving locations, did that kind of make it easier? Yeah, I mean, it made it easier, and um, but I guess the, the beginning of the transition, just like any new place, is like mm. trying to start the routine, the schedule, yeah. what can we do, what, can, what can't we do, and yeah and but like after i would say like a few months we kind of figured out a, a process and 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 now we have the team kind of set up properly so i'm I'm really excited also if if i for some reason i don't get another fight for a while mm. i have i have projects going on yeah. like i want to build the team and, and we i want us to be like a phuket top team mm. i want us to be like tiger I want like, us like to a be destination like, spot but in the city in the city because not everybody wants to go to the beach yeah. some guys get bored out there i hear it all the time from guys down south yeah. it's like bro it's just the same piece of strip of yeah land of one day. street and some beaches and some beaches yeah. you know i mean maybe if you're there for a trancation you're trying to stay healthy and this yeah. and that but yeah, some of those dudes I, I hear that too from guys who have lived in phuket for extended periods yeah. and who have been training, you know, down there a long time. The guys who have had like, like you look at Glenn, who's had a, a very long career with Tiger. Yeah. But he goes away a lot. Yeah. Well, he I don't, think you need that. Yeah. Uh, I think you'd get a little burnt out. That kind of island, uh, island syndrome. Fever. Yeah. Island yeah. fever. Yeah. Island fever. Yeah. You know, you're, th- there really isn't much in Phuket. Whereas in Bangkok, there's there's everything. so much to do. I mean, yeah. what is the most visited? I think I saw some yeah, most visited city, city in the, the world, world yeah. man. And there's a good reason for it. So it's like if. If you're somebody who who doesn't like the beaches, or maybe you're just kind of burnt out on that scene, you've been doing it for mm. a long time. I think Bangkok is an excellent, not only for that, to build yourself. I mean, like you said, I had mm. a big following there. I built a network here of a lot of people. Yeah, you know, and, for sure. and, I, and I made something here. And so, if, if people wanted that opportunity, I could help mm. them. And when you came in, you definitely heard it. Like the, the crowd popped. Yeah. Right. And you know, I but I think at the same time, like you said, with elite, like you want to build a destination. There is no real destination in, facility in, in Bangkok. Bangkok. No. You know, there there is for Muay Thai. There's a few Muay Thai places that have set up, but there's no MMA. No, and then even know. for our gym for the Muay Thai scene, I mean, having guys like Trainer Gay and yeah. Joy, and uh, is in, I mean, who's basically kind of taking over for our MMA Muay Thai program is Zidoff Akuma. Okay. And um, me and him have been friends for a while, but then after, uh, you know, with, with, with Tommy leaving the gym, there was kind of a hole. And, I mean, I was running my home camp, but at mm. times you need somebody else to, to kind step of in, step yeah. in. And he stepped in and really helped my, my strike. As you saw in the yeah. fight, man, I was, I was surprised at myself at times in yeah, that your hands in the Muay good. Thai. Yeah. And the clinch and, and yeah. the knees and everything kind of started flowing naturally. And that was the game plan we originally had for Kerr. If mm. I had a strike, I had answers for him, you know. Yeah, and it, it you know you really did look like you were putting pieces together better than I had seen in the past. Yeah. In, in the past, like yeah, you were you were a grappler. You took guys down, uh, other than your five second yeah. knockout. That <laughs> yeah, you know, but we didn't really see much of you in that fight except yeah. a couple punches. Yeah. And, and you know, I mean, and good, I, good punches. Don't get me wrong, yeah. but you know that's all we saw. Yeah, exactly. But this this last fight with Vanat, you really strung it together. Yeah, and then being able to chain it together, and I think yeah. that's where like a lot of not that the Muay Thai guys are missing, but it's like if you're an MMA guy and you come out here, you're learning Muay Thai for Muay Thai. You're not yeah. learning Muay Thai for MMA, you know, and I think that's a big hole still. We see that a lot with Muay Thai guys who are early in the transition yeah. where even they, they don't throw hands because in Muay Thai, a lot of guys don't throw a lot of hands yeah. at their setups. Or, you know, they can stop a takedown or they can get a trip, but then they don't know what to do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly, it, man. It, it, it's it, it's a adaptive thing that they need to pick up. Yeah, so th- I mean that's why I'm happy to have Zidoff because look at like a good example, Team Alpha Male. They bring mm-hmm. in, they bring in um, Dwayne Ludwig. Mm-hmm. They bring in um, who's, who's the who's the guy that's here now? He yeah, I, I, I know who you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. I, can't remember, um, I can't think of his name, but, God dang it. but yeah, like look they, they they bring in they bring in proper Muay Thai coaches for Muay Thai, you know, and then they adapt it to MMA and that's everywhere in the States and, and still here is a big hole. Yeah. I, I think uh, I remember uh, early on when I was training in, uh, in Rhode Island and the guy who was running the gym was doing quite a bit of like a crossover training with Mark Delagrati. Yeah. But uh, so the guy who was running the gym I was training at the uh, JBA place was doing a lot of training with uh, Mark Delagrati. Mm who runs Sit Yon Tong in America. And they were doing a ton of work on, like, striking from the clinch and, and, like, hitting takedowns. And it wasn't long after that you saw Mark start to work with Kenny Florian yeah. in the UFC and then George St. Pierre. And a lot of guys were coming to Boston to train at Sit Yon Tong 
with Mark and you saw that style start to drip more into the MMA scene. Which I think, I mean, I mean, with, with like guys with Conor McGregor, it's kind of changed the idea that, oh, like flat-footed Muay Thai doesn't work, but real Muay Thai works. Mm. And the incorporations of knees and elbows, particularly for a guy who's a grappler who doesn't mind yeah. getting into the clinch, to have weapons in there and then have the ability to take them down, that just it makes you twice as much of a dangerous fighter. And now. to understand the, the mechanics of that Muay Thai clinch. Yeah. It's very powerful. Very powerful. I, I noticed that in that fight, man. Yeah. It was just like, it just felt like we, we drilled that a yeah. lot. A lot. Being stuck in the clinch as well. What yeah. would happen if, if he locked up? Because uh, Kerr, Kerr's really nasty in the clinch. He had some deadly elbows. So mm -hmm. we had to, I, like I said, we had to have some answers for that. Yeah. And, um, man, it was just kind of nice to feel like, oh, man, I feel on fire. This is like second nature to me right now. now. I'm sure for a wrestling clinch perspective, you, you don't care. Like, you're, you're, that comes second nature to you. Yeah. But what was it like transitioning over to that Muay Thai clinch and, and understanding, like, the double kind of neck the double, to the, the plum, plum and then as opposed to, like, a collar tie and arm? Yeah, exactly. I mean, just locking up the plum, just kind of getting used to, to getting that frame built squeezing in. Squeezing the yeah, elbows. Squeezing the elbows in. And then, especially after the Medi fight, like, I felt like, that knee cost me. I mm. bet if I had trained more in the clinch for that fight, things probably would have been a little bit different. Mm. So, like, really getting accurate with them. Um, like, Zidoff said something to me that's, like, I guess Pige told him when he was fighting, which mm. is don't strike unless you're sure. Mm. If you don't know if you can hit the strike, don't throw it. Because in Muay Thai, if you throw a thing and, it, and the guy checks it or kicks, it hurts, man. <laughs> yeah, it hurts <laughs> just as bad for you. So you have to be really really sure you're gonna land these strikes just don't throw wild out there and by the same token though a yeah. lot of times you can throw strikes as setups and feints yeah. and you know yeah man yeah you know, you, everything you throw can't land everything you throw can't be a knockout right right so there's there's levels to this there's levels for sure yeah you know but um and then like like i was saying we want to make that a destination because the the quality of muay thai that they have there there are world champions mm. in there they're you know we have a lot of guys who fight for max mm. got a lot of guys that are, are fighting for like high level championship belts and and uh to incorporate that into our mma program mm. i think is going to be huge for anybody that wants to come here and where are you guys at camp. now you're you're right off the train right yeah we're right off of the pong pong bts at uh, sigma 31 dash one or 30 okay. dash one so you're, you're like smack in the middle of the yeah, city. Yeah, right in the heart of the city, yeah, man. Yeah. And I mean, it's a sky, we have like a we're ten stories up. It's a beautiful yeah. sky view outside, and we have air, in Jiu Jitsu gym. We have aircon, which Yo, I man, think I, is a I, lovely. I, I get ner <laughs> one. I don't like training in aircon all the time. Well, I say that, but then when I don't train in aircon, I really appreciate aircon. You appreciate it, yeah. But I, I get nervous training in gyms that are high up. Yeah, because like I, I know someone's gonna bump a window at some point. It's just gonna happen. <laughs> Do, do I want to trust that they were put in properly? No. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 yeah, man, so uh, this next year, that's the goal is to build a team. I mean, right after this last fight, I already got calls from people from Malaysia who are interested in training with us, people from uh, the States. For sure. Who are interested in coming and training with us now. And uh, Smack in the middle of the city there. Yeah, you yeah, know. It's a good location. So I think it would be a good opportunity and, and being handed the whole program. It's kind of nice. They kind of give me the freedom. It's like, so now I'm thinking in my head, it's like, well, well how did I always want a proper camp to be run? Mm. And what would make me feel confident if I was if I was the one coming here and training? And so uh, I'm just excited, man. But you were saying before that you were running your own camp before yeah. this, right? And that's going to be tough, like, to, to run your own camp because you don't really – you don't have anyone to give you perspective. Exactly. Of what you're doing or if you're improving, right? Yeah. That, that's going to be a challenge. It, there was a challenge, and that's why it was nice for Zidoff to step up, at least particularly for the striking area. And then I, I brought in um, Lee Livingstone from a uh, Oh, yeah, Big Lee Foot, from Bigfoot, yeah. Yeah, just because, I mean, I'm the head of the jiu-jitsu program there, mm. this and that, but I still need somebody to watch me, and yeah. I, I trust them. Yeah, Lee's legit. Hey, man, like uh, when, when I choose a, a jiu-jitsu instructor, I have a few things I always require. It's like either they've had to compete at a high level of, of jiu-jitsu, and they've had to have fought. Mm. For some reason, I just I have to know that they fought. Did Lee fought before? He fought like twelve times, man. Yeah, I didn't he know had that. A pretty good record too. Yeah, and then and uh, I like it because he's honest. Yeah, you know he's not gonna be like, oh yeah, I did a great, great job. He'll say, hey man, that was mm. shit. Yeah, Lee, <laughs> Lee's a straight guy, and he's actually he's very critical in the way like I, I've talked to him about like him breaking down stuff before, and he's very critical about it. 
And, and I really like that, the way he looks at it with a critical eye. Same. Like, okay, look at this, look at this. Same, exactly. So it's like I, that, that was nice to, to bring him in and being like, hey, man, I need help for this camp. Dude, that, the cruise ship uh, fights I was telling you about uh-huh. before, Lee was one of the other refs on that. Oh, really? And, uh, <laughs> the night before we left, uh, <laughs> me and him had to share a room in the hotel before we went, and they only had a room with one bed left. <laughs> I woke up the next day. He was a bit too far on my side. Oh, yeah. Did you just spin him with you a little bit? I was like, damn, Lee. <laughs> he was like, that was the best nap I ever had. Man. Want to do that again? <laughs> yeah, I like Lee a lot, though. He still he still trains um, Shannon and Rika, too, right? Yeah, he still trains Shannon and Rika. And, um, Funny how that works. Yeah. Yeah, but it's good. I mean, it's good for him. I mean, the mm-hmm. reason why everybody trains with him because he's a really excellent coach. He Dude, actually legit. even helped me with boxing for MMA for this fight as well. Oh wow! Really to help me get my footwork down because you know he said it was shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember when um, when uh, he was the head coach at Fight Lab yeah. for a while, and he left. He had the opportunity to open Bigfoot, mm-hmm. and I think it was just a, a good move for him. I think so too, and uh, like right, as of right now, just being like a tenth planet guy and a nogi guy, obviously that's always my specialty. But yeah. I still want to continue to work towards getting my black belt in gi jujitsu, so I chose to train under him. Okay, nice. Yeah. So I, I hate wearing a gi. I, just, I hate gi jujitsu in general. I uh, do too. It's like like I think it was Gore Ryan said it best. It was like uh, gi jujitsu is like having sex with a condom on it. <laughs> it takes a lot longer to finish and it's not as fun. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it's hundred percent true. Hundred percent. That, that is a perfect analogy. Um, you know, but. But I think my girlfriend trains at a Q23 with oh, nice. Adam. Adam, so, Adam's excellent teacher yeah. as well. That's so why we have the mats here. We throw these out on the, oh, uh, nice, on the terrace. We'll do and, a little uh, drilling and yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 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 she gets mad if I like power slam her or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> she, 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 I told her, you want to roll with the big dogs. You right? <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, so like sometimes I'll pop in over there and train. But I just, I, I, I'm really fighting it because I'm really fighting like the gi. gi. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know, th- that's all they do there. Yeah. And Adam's fantastic. He, he is an amazing teacher. I appreciate, like, the way that he breaks things down and he goes through. And he has that, that Gracie curriculum that he mm-hmm. runs through. And my girlfriend did uh, the, um, uh, what's it called, uh, women's co- Women Empowerment with uh, Bev. Oh, yeah. Where they do the Gracie uh, Women uh, Empowered. D- Diesel Diva. Yeah, Diesel yeah, Diva, yeah. yeah. she's cool, man. Yeah, she's a great friend of mine and of Jibs. And, uh, but, yeah, so Jib is really into it now. But she, she's still waiting for the one day she can get a choke on me. <laughs> It'll come soon, one day. Yeah, she, she's gotten day. she's gotten close a few times. I don't I don't tell her how close she's gotten, but she's yeah. gotten close. Oh man, dude. I mean, I mean, especially now being like a, a full time instructor. I, I like I remember when Kurt Ozzie was in town. He said something where it's like teaching jujitsu is like teaching a snake how to bite you better. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a great. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, um, especially with Stan, bro. Like. Yeah, uh, I'm a little hesitant to keep teaching him stuff. <laughs> yeah, he's. Like, like, I I told you I was I was critical of of his jujitsu when I saw him at Copa de Bangkok. You know, and because he really was, you know, not not great, but he's yeah. a freak of a human being. And granted, he started in February with me. Yeah, and, so and what, what like was a, that like? Uh, September was the uh, yeah. Copa de Bangkok. Yeah, or, yeah, or August. But he's a freak of a human being. So how old is he? Like twenties? I think he's twenty nine. So he's 29. He looked like he's shredded. He's yeah. a natural heavyweight. He was what 107 kg for that fight at FMD. Yeah, and he's fast for a heavyweight. Yeah. I haven't seen a lot of heavyweights move as quick as he can. Yeah, no. Yeah, not not at all. Yeah. And he looks like a Zangief from a Street Fighter. Dude, when he walks in my gym, I'm like, you freaking kidding me, dude? <laughs> <laughs> so, but, I mean, he he looks freakishly strong. And the way I saw him manhandling people at the Copa de Bangkok. You, you could tell that's why he got by. I mean, he has a lot of room to grow. Yeah. But what I was so impressed by, I hadn't seen him fight until FMD. And we were talking about yeah. this before, is how measured he is. Right? And, like, a lot of am- amateur debut. Right? I remember my first fight. And when I fought, this is back in the early 2000s. There was no amateur scene. I had to fight pro my first yeah. fight. Back and in the day, dude. Ba- back in the day. <laughs> and, you know, like, so I was fighting a guy whose record on Sherdog was like one in three, but I had seen him fight like six times. Uh-huh. Right? So like I, like, like I know this guy's had a ton of experience. I was so nervous. I remember going out, and I was a grappler. No one expected me to get a knockout. I went out, and I just started pumping my jab, and the guy fell over, and I just started hammer fisting him. And then like five seconds later, fight's done. 
Right. I remember I'm trying to like run out. It was in a ring. It wasn't even in a cage. I'm trying to run out of the ring so I can go to the bathroom. My coach had to stop me from coming through the ropes. He's like, you have to wait and get your hand raised. Go make sure he's okay. I'm like, I got to pee. He's like, I don't care that you have to pee. Pee in your shorts. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and all up into that fight, I thought I was gonna puke. I mean, it was the same man. In my first fight, I thought I was gonna throw up so yeah. bad. I felt like I had to take a shit like every five yeah, seconds. Man. Exactly. <laughs> I, I felt bad for my like looking back on. It, I feel bad for my coach. He just had to kind of babysit me, you yeah. know. But um, and that was just me being rushed. I didn't I didn't know to control my strikes or anything like that. And what I saw in Stan was he didn't have that. He didn't have that nervousness well, throwing he hands. He went back in Ukraine. He fought a lot on the streets. So he's just like, yes, yeah, whatever. I could see a guy who looks like Zangief. I could see that. He's like, yeah, no problem. And no problem. I punch in the face, yeah? <laughs> I eat the borscht. <laughs> but no, I, I'm excited to see how he does against an actual heavyweight, yeah. though. Because I mean, yeah, the, the, the guy, guy was fought. a welterweight that he fought that just likes just to like, eat too much to eat. Taco Bell yeah. or Burger King, whatever yeah. they got down there. And uh, he, he was, he's had a lot of experience. He's good. But if you're a fat welterweight that's fighting at heavyweight, you, you don't stand a chance against any heavyweight that's a natural heavyweight. Yeah, just a different frame, man, a different body type. It's, it's not even power close. He has, yeah. yeah what, when he was hitting him, you could, you could feel the hits like yeah. reverb through the cage. Uh, that's what I was thinking. I mean, I couldn't go up to coach him because I was still downstairs warming up myself. But just watching the stream, I was just like, ow. Yeah. <laughs> Granted, I, I give him his opponent for stand, standing the whole time, though, man. I don't think he even dropping. landed a punch, though. I don't think he no. landed a single punch. No. And but, but every punch stand through was measured and timed and landed. Yeah, and I mean that's work with Paul and that's work with uh, um, the Muay Thai guys and yeah. off You know, they have, having really good striking there. And then yeah, like you said, I also noticed too at Copa he does have some holes still in his game, but I'm trying to teach him how to stay heavy on top. Yeah, if he learns that, it's going to be super key for him at least for the first four fights. Gonna, you know, at heavyweight, he's going to end up fighting a wrestler at some point, so yeah. he's going to learn to stand up. Yeah, yeah, you know, he's got to learn how to get off his back. But you know, I got to imagine he, he's not going to be able to get many pro amateur fights. He's going to have to go pro well, I, sooner I, rather than I later. I told him that as well. I was like, listen, man, I'm probably going to give you maybe one or two if that. Yeah. I know he's definitely has another fight December 1st, but... Well, he's I'll fighting Tangmo, though. Tangmo, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is well, that Tangmo. MMA? MMA. That's going to be an interesting one. <laughs> I remember what Tangmo murked that, uh, that roided-up cop dude. Tyson, I think Yeah. Was. Yeah. And, uh, that, that looked like cartoonish. It, you know, it and like, like cartoonish knockout. Like just Tyson like, guy because he clearly looks like he's he's on juice, and he comes out and he just gets murked by like a three hundred pound Tangmo. Just smiling, dancing yeah. afterwards. Yeah, I was judging that fight. Man. Tangmo, who, Tangmo, <laughs> who's never won a fight. He's never won a fight up until that point, and he gets like a, a first round knockout against a guy who just looks freakishly yeah strong huge. yeah. 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 Yeah, man. I, so we'll see. And then I would like to get him one more just to focus on his ground skills. It would be, I mean, it would definitely and be good for him to, I, I would love to see him get like four, five amateur fights. This is the thing though. He's 20. If you said he's 29 years old, right? He's a little bit older, especially for a heavyweight. Heavyweights don't generally get too far into their thirties. Mm. You know, not everyone's a Daniel Comier yeah. or like a, a Randy Couture who yeah. can fight later on. Um, and, there's just not a, he's not going to get a challenge amateur heavyweight. I mean, Darren Lowe is the only other amateur heavyweight I can think of. Where's he fight him? He's Malaysian. Oh. He's like a four time unbeaten MEMA champion. Oh, really? So he, he's won that MEMA tournament year after year after year just because he's a real heavyweight. But I don't think he's fighting anymore. Ah. Oh. Yeah. Bummer. I was about to say that, but you're going on. And he's, <laughs> a, he, up, he's, a, he's a big boy, man. He, he, and, like, that would be a fantastic fight because Darren's got – well, it'd be kind of unfair for Stan because Darren does have a lot, a lot more experience. experience. He won the entire tournament the first year, and then uh, I've seen him stop guys, like, on one punch and just, you know, end, end their nights. And he's got that power that Stan has, yeah. but he's just more experienced. Where I think, like, in the amateur ranks, you shouldn't be putting guys who are, like, the same build, same body type, and one guy has 12 fights, fights and the other guy, guy has, has one. one. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, like I said, man, he's definitely one of my projects. Like, I think I think he has the skill set. He obviously yeah. has the athleticism. And he's pretty smart. Yeah. Granted, he, he's, like, every training session, he's filming everything. 
And nice. then afterwards, he'll have, send me clips, and he's like, what should I do here? What should I do that? So you can tell he's very analytical. Nice. And um, I guess he has, like, access to all these, like, Russian YouTube channels where apparently I didn't know Russia was so obsessed with MMA. But he'll just send me these, like, Russian YouTube clips of training and, and just their tr- – I'm learning stuff because I never understood the, that Russian style of training methods. Yeah, they're, they're on a different. other level. Yeah, so I, ju- I just watched uh, Icarus last night or oh, two yeah. nights ago with the uh, the drug uh, doping yeah, documentary. Yeah. I haven't seen it. I just saw the Rogan podcast with the guy, but I thought it was very interesting for him to say that if you want to win a gold medal, there is no way you're going to win it as a nat- natural without any PEDs. Well, I mean, at the same time, you know, <laughs> here, here in Asia, right, I don't know a lot of natural, a lot of guys who are fighting that aren't using PEDs in one, one way or another. You know, whether it's for recovery or yeah. for actual performance enhancement, you know, the, there's just way too many dudes who are completely shredded, you know, with no cardio. You look like a bodybuilder. Yeah, right and, and like you have no you, cardio. How do, you, how do you even look like that? It is, it's, it's impossible, you know. Um, but, I mean, even it's interesting in the States, even with USADA and all that, like, I, I mean, I, like I said, I've been in the, the game for a long time. I know a lot of guys at, at the high level, and, I mean, nobody's taking steroids anymore, but there's yeah. there's other ways it's around taking it. taking stuff, They're yeah. taking something, you know, and, and... John Jones is taking everything. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> shit, take pills out the <laughs> egg, man. I mean, that's what, I mean, that's what I gotta get on. Well, you know, I, I think, you know, this is, I think a lot of people are still taking steroids in, in the UFC, and they're just getting they're, better... Better, passing it. better people to work with them on how to be clean yeah. when they test. Yeah, exactly. Whereas here in Asia, I mean, you know, Risen doesn't test. One Championship doesn't test for PEDs. Yeah. And you know, I kind of feel like that's the better approach to the extent that you have to make the assumption as a fighter that everyone's on, on something. Yeah. Well, the thing is, too, like what I feel bad in the States, like talk, what's his name? Sean O'Malley. Mm. You, nobody knows that guy in on steroids, yeah. man. But then he gets popped for something that's in a supplement, and it's just like, you know, and then it's like, okay, so you're going to ban all supplements? Yeah. You know, and then what's an advantage? You know, what's – if a guy takes DHEA, which is a natural thing that promotes ter- – is that an advantage? Like, where 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 does the line draw? Well, I, I think he, he's definitely a, a unique case. It, it's very obvious from looking at him yeah. that he – I don't know what he was taking, but it wasn't working anyway. Yeah, they said it's like a tainted supplement, that is what they were saying. This is but, the problem I have with the, the whole tainted supplement have become too much of an excuse Juice. for people yeah. who are like, oh, you know, I tested positive for steroids after I knocked out someone and, you know, it's a tainted supplement. Yeah. You know, that's where I, I feel bad. Like, like I, I like DC a lot. And as a fighter, as technique-wise, I like Jones. Yeah. As a person, I have, I have a lot of questions about his character. Man, I used to, even when he was a shitty person, I was still a fan. But yeah, like no, after I'm still this, a fan. After this last one, man, I was like, come on, bro, you're going to rap people out? Like, yeah. come on, how far are you going to That's rap? true, yeah. You're going you you to turn rap to get you You're going to wear a wire, dude, in the gym, so. <laughs> you ever watch uh, Tommy Toehold? Oh, I love Tommy Toehold. You see the one where, uh, <laughs> right after they announced that John was a snitch, that he made a video where, like, John Jones was calling uh, DC at, at like midnight or something, 4 a.m. and said USADA on the caller ID. <laughs> and he's like, hey, uh, Daniel, man, uh, if you're on something, you can tell me, bro. It's okay. <laughs> It's just, it's like, it's, that show is oh. so funny. Oh, man. Yeah, we used to watch it back in the day when it was like uh, G- GSP and the Diaz Brothers ones. Where, like, oh, the aliens. Classics, dude, <laughs> the aliens. I'm in my dark place. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's all hiding in a locker somewhere. <laughs> oh, man. The, the GSP ones were fantastic. Oh, uh, yeah. Anytime you showed the Diaz, it would just be all smoky. Oh, yeah. Oh, it was the one. It was like, oh, he shows up. It's like it's all smoke coming out of Diaz's house. And yeah. he's like, what's going on? You a cop? <laughs> <laughs> I like whenever he has Nate. He's uh, like, uh, before I go, I got shout outs to Pizza Strips, Tostitos. Being so delicious. <laughs> uh, the, the, he just, that show is fantastic. Sky for having clouds. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Jackson, that white glove. Yeah, man. Oh, it's classic, dude. Yeah, yeah. Tommy told us uh, one of the best things on the yeah, internet. I mean, if you guys now. don't know who he is, you guys got to look that up. Yeah, I'll, I'll put a link to his channel just uh, because anyone who listens to this should know. I mean, if you don't know, you got to punch yourself in the face. But it, It's my favorite way to get <laughs> MMA news, even though I know half of his bull crap. It's just, it's just my favorite way to get to get the news, dude. <laughs> uh, my favorite is whenever he has Dana White on. He's like, all right, sit, sit, sit the fuck down. down and shut the fuck up, you goofs. You goofs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really disappointed. I made a lot of money off this Khabib fight, but I just can't count it right now. I'm just the governor was there, guys. <laughs> I, I'm about to go. Sp- I'm about to go win like forty million dollars at blackjack. And, uh, oh, it's I can't so even good. count how much money we made. I'm so disappointed. 
put a black eye on the sport. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's such a it's such a critical commentary, but done in such a fun way. Yeah, yeah, I lo- I loved it, man. It, it's a great show. Well, dude. When one signed Eddie Alvarez, they announced it about a week before the DJ announcement, and they did it. He did an episode. He's like, in other news, Eddie Alvarez is signed with one championship. He's about to go get jacked. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, I got to look up that one, dude. That one's going to be a good one, then. Yeah, it, it was just like that one line. It's like he's about to go fight an Asian and be jacked. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you look at a lot of the guys in who fight in one or fight in Risen, fight in Road, you, you look at their bodies and you're like, I wonder. Oh, man, he's on that good acai, dude. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Those Brazilian guys, man. man uh, some, uh, some Mexican supplements right there for sure. But, but you know what, man? The one heavyweight division has got the softest looking heavyweights in the world. I don't know, man. It's, Even shoot. Brandon Vera looks soft these days. Yeah, yeah. Well, shoot, he's getting pretty old now too, huh? Yeah. I saw him in Singapore uh, in May at the uh, One Nielsen Media Conference, and I almost didn't recognize him, and I was like, Brandon Vera, he's like, yeah, I took a photo with him. But, I mean, he's, he's a big dude. He's still muscular. He's still, you know, Merck and, you know, most of the guys in Asia. But yeah. he's just like, you remember when he was light heavyweight and he was, yeah. like, really lean Fighting and caught. Like John and, Jones. Man, yeah. I used to love him back then. He was a murder until John Jones until freaking. John Jones smashed his face into him. Yeah, freaking elbow from hell, dude. I think destroyed his orbital yeah, or something right? like it that. Broke yeah, right. It broke it. Yeah. Oh. That was a that was a tough fight. Yeah, that was a really tough fight. And in his hometown, man. I remember I was in San Diego. We were watching that on TV, rooting yeah. for him. You know, and is he from San Diego? Yeah. or Did he relocate to San Diego? I think he re- relocated there because he was training out of Alliance for a long time. He was a Lloyd Irvin guy, wasn't he? I believe I don't remember, man. Because I remember he was in the Air Force, mm-hmm. and then I remember when I was in San Diego going to school, he was down training at Alliance, well, that, right, right that, in Chula Vista. Because I remember Lloyd Irvin was in Maryland or something, yeah. Baltimore. And, uh, of course, this is before Lloyd Irvin was all rapey and stuff. Yeah, yeah, the whole culty, <laughs> cult, cult culty rape thing, yeah. culty rapey thing going on. But, um, and, yeah, he had, he had been separated from Lloyd Irvin for a long time anyway before all that came out. The master marketer, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The guy yeah. can market some, some jiu-jitsu. You know, you know, so you know who uh, Roddy Ferguson is? No. Uh, Olympo, Olympic judo uh, player, heavyweight. Uh, he was, like, one of the Lloyd Irvin disciples. Oh, yeah. And I had, like, the same marketing plan, like, when he first got out. He fought once in uh, Strike Force, fought once in MMA and Strike Force at like light heavyweight, and uh, he had he had gone to Abu Dhabi and uh, didn't do so well. Like back when Abu Dhabi used to issue like uh, invitations, yeah, before they had the whole trials and like pre qualified type thing, and uh, he didn't do so well against like you know Jeff Munson was you know back then was like the king of the heavyweight division and uh, right, Pano and. Um, uh, who else was the big heavyweight? Uh, Dean Lister rolled heavyweight one year. Yeah, at, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I used to train under him. I remember when he was like a welterweight. He was a welterweight at one point. Yeah, Are you I think. Serious? Yeah, <laughs> and then like he was a heavyweight. Dude, that guy had like no neck when I would when I would go train at his classes in the evening. I would just trip out. It's like this guy has it's just traps. It's just like. I don't know. He was a middleweight, right? He used to fight at 84. Yeah, that would make more sense. I, I could definitely see him at 84, but like welterweight. Yeah, I, th- I could have sworn for sure he was, a, he was a welterweight when he first started. Yeah, man, the boogeyman, dude. I use all of my escapes are still under what, what he taught me as but a white belt. Early 2000s, he was like the guy. Yeah. Like he was just murking everyone. I mean, I think up into uh, up until that Josh Barnett fight, I think he was undefeated, they were saying. Really? Yeah. I can't look. remember how many years he had strung up undefeated, but up until, I believe, when he got Scarfold. So he had, if I, no, it looks like he lost his uh, second fight. No, I mean ju- in jiu-jitsu. Oh, in jiu-jitsu. Yeah, I know he didn't do too too well in MMA. But uh, I no, think he, he lost in 2000 to uh, at Grappler's Quest to Mark Lehman. Mark Lehman? Yeah. What, was that? what was the finish? Points. Two Points. to four. Uh, maybe it was just submission. I don't know. I remember that on that... Uh, what is it, Metamoris or whatever? That's what they were saying. Yeah, he doesn't have... Let me see. When's his first loss by anything other than points? Yeah, uh, Josh Barnett. Oh, I remember this. Yeah, that was sick, dude. I yeah. mean, that was another Metamoris. catch guy. You yeah. got super excited when you saw that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, oh, God, I remember this now. Yeah, him and, and this was at heavyweight. This is back in 2015. So that was his first submission loss. loss. Yeah. 
And uh, oh, the scarf hold, yeah, oh, yeah. Josh Barnett. Man. Oh man, I love that guy, dude. J- Josh Barnett <laughs> is like, remember when he came back as the War Master? The War Master, <laughs> yes, dude. And uh, that was in Strike Force, right, or Elite XC? I can't yeah. remember if it was. I think it was Strike Force, right? And then Daniel Cormier just murked him. Yeah, yeah, it had to have been Strike Force. <sighs> yeah, so it looks like oh, so he was always grappling at like ninety eight kg, ninety nine kg, ninety nine kg. So I guess he never fought at welterweight. He just looked... I just remember him looking small. For probably a brief time, man. Because every time I've seen him, that dude looks like just a ball of muscle, man. I saw something the other day where, like, a meth addict broke into his house. <laughs> and he, like, pulled his gun. <laughs> well, you can pull a gun on the boogeyman, dude. It's a hell of a... No, no, no. Like, oh, D- the Dean g- pulled, Dean pulled a gun, gun on him. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, is this even necessary, Dean? <laughs> well, the guy grabbed, like, a pipe. Oh, Okay, yeah, there you go. Uh, let me see if I can find it. But yeah, I mean, and nobody gives him uh, as much love as they should because he's the one who inspired Danaher to do yeah. all the footlocks. <laughs> you know, Danaher yeah. is like taking it to another level, though. And I, I'm sure you saw him on. Uh, on uh, Joe Rogan. Yeah. And uh, it's funny, like, I I always knew he had an issue with his leg. I didn't realize that he had, like, fake hips, fake knees, and, like, it was all due to, like, a botched surgery when he was a kid. So. Oh, I didn't know that. I just thought it was because he was overtraining or something. No, no, he had a botched surgery when he was a kid on his knee. Oh, they had it on camera? So Dean, <laughs> Dean, Dean Lister filled it. This is a real, this is not like a Bro, movie. Bro, this, this guy looks a- like Voldemort, man. <laughs> right? <laughs> He should not be named for sure. Oh my god! Like so, the guy you see at the very end of the video, uh, the guy picks up like a uh, a pipe. So this guy, like, he doesn't even look human. No, he doesn't look like a person at all, dude. He looks like a straight alien. He looks like uh, James Irvin when he cut down to uh, <laughs> middleweight. <laughs> you remember that, James Irvin, dude? Remember when he cut to middleweight oh. and he looked like this dude? Oh my god! What do you uh, what do you fight, Anderson? No, he fought Anderson. No, they fought Anderson at light heavyweight. That's yeah. right. Let's see. He grabs the pipe, and that's when uh, he <laughs> pulls out the gun. Pulls the gun out, and uh, the guy left. And if you read the article, Dean Lister's like, "Oh, the cop said I would have been in the right to shoot him," but he's like, "That's not what I'm about." Nah. But yeah, man. Uh, yeah, remember James Irvin fought. Uh, he went down to middleweight. He just looked like, he looked like he a crack like skeleton. Yeah. Who did he fight at middleweight? I think. Yeah, let me let's look, let's look that up. The Sandman. Didn't he had a fast KO too? It was in like six, eight, seven seconds or something like that. Or yeah, didn't he knock out um, uh, Teddy something? Yeah, and I remember that was the hype build up to when Anderson jumped up to light heavyweight. Remember, didn't James Irvin get murked by um, uh, what's his name, uh, Houston Alexander? Yes, he did. Who? Yeah, man. Then that was after he. Uh, Gosh, what's the guy's name? Um, he, he had that herky-jerky style. I can't remember his name right now. Right? Um, uh, Dean Keith Amin. Jardine. Keith Jardine. Yeah. Dean Amin. He murked, he murked, he murked him, too. He, he had some weird movement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that herky-jerky style. <laughs> yeah, herky-jerky. <laughs> Alessio Sakara. No, that, that had to be a light head. No, that was. That had to be his. Or Igor Porajak. One of those had to be at uh, middleweight. Because that was after Anderson. Yeah, man, because... I don't know, James beat Houston Alexander. Oh, he beat him? Yeah. Huh. TKO in the second round. Yeah, who's the guy? Oh, Terry Martin. He beat Terry Martin with like a flying knee nine seconds into round <laughs> that's two. That's it. That's it. That's what I remembered from the, the all the promos. Yeah. That, that was like his one big like shot. And that man. was his UFC debut. Yeah. I remember like after that Anderson fight, because uh, he, he, I think he trains out in NorCal as well, and... Uh, on the NorCal circuit, you see everybody, and that was right after the fight. He still had a black eye from when Anderson hit him. Like, it was like a permanent black back, like a Rich really? Franklin, like, black eye <laughs> yeah. thing going on. Rich Franklin still got that. Yeah, <laughs> dude. It was just, it was crazy. We're like, hey, dude. <laughs> Citrus Heights, California is where he's yeah. out of. Yeah, so that's um that's right outside Rockland, which is like uh, like a outer district of Sac. Okay, so that's, yeah. is that no, this Central North, California or North, Northern, Northern California? California. Yeah. yeah, Sacramento. Yeah. Yeah, man, it's a, uh, he, yeah, I really, I always liked watching him fight, but like you always get the impression like, yeah, he's going to just go home and drink this money away. Yeah, for sure. You know, uh, I mean, that, that was always cool about like 
training out in Northern California, like as an amateur. That's where most of my career was out of Chico. Yeah. And uh, we were always like sparring with guys or fighting against like Team Alpha Male guys and and all of uh, like the, the Team Diaz Alpha Males in Sacramento, right? Yeah, in Sacramento, Sacramento, and you have like a D, um, freaking uh, Stockton, the, Diaz, Stockton, the yeah. Diaz brothers. That's way up in Northern Cali, though, right? Lodi. Well, yeah, their their Lodi. gym's out of Lodi. But we were always that. Those are the guys we used to fight. Their Amies and our Amies were always fighting each other. So is Lodi like? Uh, is it inner California? It's like, it's like kind of uh, in between Sacramento and the Bay Area. It's like desert, dude. If you want to go f- skydiving out there, you can do it for less than a hundred bucks. Really? In shorts too, if you <laughs> really? really wanted to. I'm not going to do it, but you can. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those places. It's huh? One of those places, a little cheap, you know. Oh, so I, yeah, I see it here on the map. It's like uh, it's like Central California. It's, yeah. So it's like in the inland. It's not. Yeah, yeah. It's like all deserty Highline place. It's it's pretty crazy. I remember when uh, I lived in Monterey. It was always weird if you go like north, or if you get like north of San Francisco, things get really weird in California. Yeah. Where you go like if you go a little bit too far east, things get really weird yeah. in California. Yeah, all that area, man, gets really weird. You know, like um. There's one area, you know, where it's producing a lot of great fighters. It's called Oroville. It just took over Stockton as the worst place in America to live. Really? Yeah. Oroville, California. It's like right, it's like probably an hour south of Chico. Oroville? Oroville. But they're, they're, they're dishing out some badass fighters. Like my buddy Benito Lopez, he just got signed by the uh, UFC like a year ago. Yep. Man, dude, like he's a killer. He's still undefeated. I think he's like 8-0. and oh. Yeah, man, I, I think, like, just bad, look, oh, yeah, that's, like, north and inland. It's yeah. north and east in California. It's a, dude, and then that's where we used to have amateur fights because they had a, a casino out there, an Indian reservation. So that's where most of us were getting all of our fights at, and the crowds were freaking crazy, dude. <laughs> so when you fight, when you're in California, for those guys who don't know, um, like, if, if everyone watches anyone who's an Asian MMA fan, you don't understand the local scene in the U.S., Indian reservations don't have to abide by state Similar. sanctions. Yeah, or... Catholic, um, especially if you're trying to fight in, in California, dude. The CSAC is tough, brutal. Right? Like, I tried to go pro there for, for a year. And just to get the licensing and everything like that was just a, just a headache, man. Really? Just an absolute headache. I would have needed $1,200 just to get my medicals done and my licensing done and mm. all that. And so my first fight, I would have fought for free, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, so it's just crazy. So the only fights you get are on Indian reservations. And so you get out there, and there's no licensing, no No medicals. licensing, no, no. It's just like fighting here, bro. <laughs> just <laughs> like, you know, like most of my first amateurs, we had elbows, we had knees. They didn't well, we're going to get you guys ready for pro fights, but you're not going to pay us like pros. <laughs> yep, well, that, you're here for the experience. <laughs> Enjoy. <All> right, dude. <laughs> Enjoy your contusions and concussions, boys. Here's 100 bucks. Thanks. So they, did they even do blood testing or no? They made us blood tests. Okay. They made it just making sure. But you not for drugs. They're just no. checking for make HIV. Make sure you got HIV. Make sure you don't no got HEP. Yeah. yeah. That was it. Sometimes you don't even get that out here. Yeah, man. <laughs> Shoot. Yeah. So I mean, it was it was a cool place to cool place to to develop as a as an amateur, and then yeah. come out here, I felt pretty confident. You so know? your first FMD fight was your first pro fight. Yeah. I could not. I tried. I, I took one year off of firefighting, man. I saved up all my money. Mm. I came out here, focused on Muay Thai for six months, and then I went back yeah. trying to fight professional. And for I did four fight camps back to back, with each opponent pulling out a week out. Oh man. Yeah. And you've already paid for your medicals and yeah. all that. Yeah. Oh, that's that's brutal. It was hard, man. Yeah. Uh, and then I was actually very close to quitting. <laughs> so you're out here full time now, though. Yeah, so man. So what d- made you leave being a firefighter and come out here to pursue Asian MMA full time? Well, I, after the fight with Feltner, I got a big following, and and then I, I won a, a jiu-jitsu tournament, and and I don't know, just my confidence felt really high, mm-hmm. and um, you know, a lot of people at the Fight Lab were saying maybe you should just stay and, and fight and yeah. and see what comes of it, man, and. At that time, I was a firefighter out in Oregon. Okay. And I was like basically like a like a like a captain. Okay. And um, I, I, met, I called my boss and I, I messaged a few of my fire buddies and asked them, I was like, hey, you know, I have an opportunity to to train out here full time and, and and do this. And they're like, man, do it. You know, you like how how many how long you've been doing firefighting? It was like probably my ninth or tenth season in firefighting. Yeah. It's like, dude, you you have the experience, you know. You you're you were a captain at 26, you know, or they call it a forestry officer in Oregon. And 
you know, how many people can say that? And you have an opportunity to pursue your dream. Mm. Like this is something you've always wanted to do. You know, it, when I wasn't firefighting, I was at the gym training yeah. just cause that's, that's what I love, man. And I said, yeah, you know, there's, there's like, if they're going to get mad at you for having a job gap because you're out in Southeast Asia fighting <laughs> in these crazy underground blood sport type <laughs> leagues, dude, I mean, that's probably somebody you don't want to work for anyways. <laughs> it's someone who's anti-blood sport leagues and underground clubs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, and then in the fire community, they like that because one, it, it shows that I have discipline, mm. that, you know, obviously I, 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 I can work hard, you know. I mean, mm. to do this, you do have to have those things. True. You know? you need to or really at least to make it yeah. far. I've seen some guys where they have a lot of talent, but they don't give a crap, but eventually you run into a dude who has talent and works hard. Yeah, those guys get washed out real quick, you know. You know it, it's tough when you think about like the fire being a firefighter too. I, I think everyone knows, uh, you know, Stephen Miokic yeah. was a a firefighter, is a firefighter. You know, that's gonna be a tough job to train at full time if you really want to make a run as a professional because it's crazy hours, right? Yeah, I mean, and then I'm not sure how it goes in Cleveland, but like a job like how he has, he's like a he works for a city department. Yeah. So majority of those guys they work like either uh, 48 on and then they have 72 off. So they have like work two days on, then three days off, two days on, three yeah. days off. And uh, what, what's his name? Chris Lytle was also a firefighter yeah. and he made it work, you know? So that's why I always thought that both of these career options were a good idea for me. Cause you do get paid, you get an hour of PT every day okay. and you get paid to work out. And okay, that, that works out that. for me. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. I remember the, the town I lived in in Rhode Island, I, I stopped into the fire department one day and they were all sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes that happens, man. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe those guys were out on a late shift, you know. Yeah, they they look honestly. They, it, not like they were like all like in bed sleeping. They were yeah. like all passed out in chairs and couches. Yeah. So I, I just assume they were exhausted and crashed. Yeah, probably good. like that was the weird thing when when you're working sometimes because because of the weird hours, mm. you know, and and they're finding out that's where a lot of the guys' health problems are actually coming from. Oh, really? They Is always that... thought it was diet. They was like, okay, we can't have pasta no more. We can't be having this. We'll start eating healthier. But then they still have a lot of heart disease, and now they found a correlation with heart disease. With uh, if you get less than six hours of sleep, really, the the, the possibility of, of heart disease gets raised. Have you ever heard of um, a guy named Rip Eselston? Rip, he, he wrote no. a book called The Engine Two Diet. No. So his father is a famous uh, vegan nutritionist from Cleveland Clinic. He was a cardiac surgeon named Caldwell Eselston, and uh, Rip is his son. He was a firefighter in Austin, I believe. And he was a uh, professional triathlon. And so, like, uh, Caldwell Eselstein, I, I would imagine the majority of his family is uh, all vegan, but Rip is as well. And uh, he wrote this book called The Engine 2 Diet. I guess, like, they, they made a small documentary about it, but all the guys who used to work in his firehouse, I guess they called Engine 2, uh, were, like, overweight, had heart disease, had cholesterol issues. And he, he built, he made all these recipes to get these guys to eat healthier. Yeah. And uh, it was funny because some of the things he talks about in the book is, like, the foods they normally eat, like, in the firehouse. And you're like, what? It's garbage. I mean, I mean, like, my specialty, my background is mainly wildland. Because in the Western states, mm. that's that's what we're doing with every summer. So you would be, like, out there right now in California fighting the... Uh, well, the, where, where it's burning right now is in Chico, dude. Okay. The whole the whole outer perimeter, of, uh, like the, there's a city called Paradise that's yeah. completely burned to the ground. Really, just done. So, yeah, is, is that the type of stuff you were doing, fighting yeah. those types of fires? Yeah. Yeah, we don't get that out east. No, no, it's a it's unique Western state thing. It's usually from Montana to Wyoming. Everything west is usually affected by wildfires. You know, it's uh. It's gonna be a, so like you're not responding to like uh. You're not responding to, like, building fires? No. I mean, I did that for a while as a volunteer, but I, I realized I didn't – right away I didn't like it. I didn't like um, – because, like, you also have to be an EMT as well because okay. majority of the times when you're on calls, 80% of the calls are medical. Yeah, like heroin addicts or old people falling over. Yeah, man, and that stuff just makes you sad, and, yeah. and, and it, it sticks with you. You see something messed up, and it sticks mm. with you for a while, so it's just like, uh, this is not for me. This is not mm. what I signed up for. So There was a movie a few years ago called uh, Only the Brave. Yeah, it was about um, the, uh, the Grand Mountain Hot Shots. Yeah. Yeah, they, um, 19 of them. Yeah, they all got burned a lot. All, yeah. In the movie, anyway, they were all burned a lot. Yeah, no, they were. The, the, when when they found them, they were not the, all. The only thing they could find was the elastic piece that was melted to their their bodies on the, from their underwear. Wow. 
and they deployed shelters and and uh i mean because i was a hot shot yeah like that that was what i did for two years yeah during some of like the hardest fire seasons in the western states like we were in colorado when we heard about what happened to them in, yeah. in arizona and uh man that was that's because like a hot shot man is like i mean we're, we're all pretty humble guys and we don't like to say this about us but we are like the special forces or like the navy seals of firefighters we mm. go where nobody will go we do the things that nobody will do now you talk about they deploy, deploy shelters, right? So like in the movie, they pull these little like uh, foil things over. Yeah, them. it's a, called a, a fire shelter, and it's basically the it's it's a f- aluminum foil that's wrapped in two sheets, and then it's like a, a like a like a almost like a ch- chicken wire yeah. in between it. And if you got to pull one of those, that means somebody fucked up. Yeah, I'm gonna be really pissed off at somebody if I have to pull one of those because because okay. that means that. We did not. We we have this thing called tens and eighteens. So, so they're fire orders, and yeah. they're and they're, uh, I guess like directions. So it's like one of them is like, do not fight a fire head on. Yeah. Okay. Another one is don't fight fire when fire is downhill of you because yeah. fire goes up easily. You know, yeah. things like that. Make sure you have a lookout so you have somebody on the other side while you're you're doing a fire assignment. You have somebody else seeing what the fire is doing. So just in case there is a change, mm. we can we can escape and then reassess. Yeah. Right. So then you have to have communications. You have to have what they call an escape route and then a safety zone. A safety zone is an area that has to be, I think, uh, shoot, man, it's been a while now, but I think it's about four times the size of the flame lengths of the fire. And that means you don't have to deploy a shelter, which is almost impossible to find when you're out there. So if you deploy the shelter, how is that, how is that supposed to save you? This little aluminum foil? I mean, they do. I mean, and then there's debates in the, in the community whether or not we should carry them or not because it's an extra two and a half pounds that we have to carry on our pack. Yeah. And usually our packs, I mean, I used to be the medic for my squad and my pack when we used to weigh on for, I think I was about 200, oh, 275 pounds with all my gear. Holy shit. Yeah. And I used to hike that every day for six months. So now if you have to pull that shelter, right, yeah. is, is that really going to save you if, like, fire is coming over you? Sometimes it does save people. But the thing is, is that if you find a, an area to deploy where there's not a lot of vegetation, yeah. and you, you basically, so what happens is, is that you, and we drill this every year. We have to yeah. do it every year at the beginning of the year, in the middle of the year, just yeah. because when, I mean, it's just like a fight, dude. You know, when yeah. your adrenaline's up, you, you got to go with what you, what you train with. Yeah. And you find the little, little tags, and you got to, like, whip it around you. And you just clear a little space, and you dig a little hole for your mouth. And yeah. you put in there your uh, if you have a radio, you bring in your radio. You put on your gloves, yeah. and you and you and you put the little the the straps have little hooks. So you wrap yeah. that around like this, and you hold tight, and you dig a hole to bring to breathe colder air in. Yeah, and. I think I think it gets up to about like a thousand degrees in there, <laughs> something like that. But most of the time, you, your legs are gonna be burnt, your arms are gonna be burnt. You're still gonna get a little bit burnt. But guys do get saved from them. Really? Guys do. There there are a lot of stories where guys do get saved from them. I mean, but like it, it just seems like so crazy because you think about like all this fire burning around you, and just like roaring fire, like. Yeah, man, and they try and simulate it when you're doing the trainings at the beginning of the year. Like they'll they'll have people like grabbing the bag and shake it because that's how it's gonna be. It's really violent, and you're just yeah. getting whipped around, and you gotta hold on to the sucker because the moment it flows up and there's a flame that goes in there, boom, you feel that hot air when it when it hits when you breathe in. That's when most people die. You don't die from the burning; you die from asphyxiation. So the the air is so hot that your that your um your alveoli, yeah. the the pockets where you exchange air in the thing reverse. And they fill up with water, and you basically choke. Oh, it just sounds so <laughs> horrible. <laughs> yeah, it's like the most horrible death I could imagine. Yeah, dude. yeah, and and uh, and and that's just a crazy thing. But like there, there was even talk from some people that maybe we shouldn't carry them because it gives sometimes a crew a false sense of security. It was like, oh, we got a fire shelter, and, and, and that's not the case, you know, that you... Yeah, I wouldn't feel so secure with a little piece of aluminum no, foil, man. No, I mean, it, it has saved people. You can look up stories where it saved some guys, but, yeah. I mean, if you got, like I said, if you got to deploy one of those, that means your superior fucked up, or the whoever that's in the division who's in charge of that area ah, fucked up. That's crazy. Yeah. You know? <laughs> that's nuts, man. Yeah. So I, I assume that there's a lot less danger as a pro fighter in Bangkok. I think so, man. I mean, I mean that's why when like people that, like think if you get really nervous or this or that, and it's like, bro, dude, no, it's, 
I mean, I'm fighting a man. I'm not fighting Mother Nature. You yeah, know, like Mother I, I Nature used to carry a piece of foil on my back. Yeah, to Mother save Nature me from don't give fire. a fuck about you, dude. I don't care what your dreams are, what your plans are. I don't give a fuck. You know. So, so next step, I know you're looking for a bigger organization. Who, who are you eyeballing? Risen, man. Yeah. Like I was telling you before that, I really want to get signed by Risen. You know, like my dream was always to fight in Japan. You know, and share that same same arena with yeah. guys like Hickson and Sakuraba and, and the Nick Diaz and 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 Shogun and Dan H- Henderson. And I think my style, I think I'm made for Japan. I think guys will love me there. I put on, I go always go on and put on a good show. For sure, you do. I mean, you you bring it every time. I bring it every time. Who who know? do they have at welterweight right now? Shoot, man, I don't even know who they have at welterweight and then risen. Well, I'll definitely take a fight against anybody. They got super heavyweights. <laughs> heavyweights. Mm, give me some of that acai, dude. <laughs> <laughs> they got, he, he can fight, they got female open weight. You can fight Gabriel, uh, Gabriel uh, Garcia. You give me a wig, bro. Let's do it. <laughs> Actually, they, they don't have. They don't have welterweight listed no. on their uh, On, on their, their roster. Yeah. And so I'm making one, Risen. You, you got to go up to 93 or you got to cut down to 70? <laughs> oh, I'm trying, trying to make it down to lightweight. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, I, this this cut, this last cut to welterweight was so easy for me that I think I can I can make the cut. I said you're walking around at eighty. Eighty. Yeah. I mean, some guys cut down from two hundred pounds. Yeah. Man. So if you could get to the point where you're walking around at seventy seven, right? Then I got to imagine seventy is not far off. For no, me. I don't. I, I think I, I think in the next couple of months I'm gonna try and, and make a test cut. Yeah. Down to it. Down to seventy. Yeah. I mean, especially in Asia, there's more opportunities at lightweight for. For me. sure. I mean, it's just weird. I'm looking at their roster and I see they've got light heavyweight and then they so they've got ninety three and they've got seventy and that's it. Yeah. And I'm I'm a bit surprised. Seventy seven. I mean, it's that's kind of the top end for Southeast Asia. Yeah. Size wise, right? You might as well be a heavyweight. At, yeah. At seventy seven. You know, and it, I think that's a great weight to sort of be at because, you know, like, like we saw with Stan's fight, you start to get above welterweight and guys are just, just bigger big. versions of welterweights or, or lightweights. Yeah. And so it's tough to get a good fight. But at, at 77, you get a lot of great fights because there are a lot of guys who, who are actually grown into that size. And a lot of them don't make like crazy cuts. And so... You know, they really fill out nicely, and they, they're at, like, their peak uh, yeah. physicality. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 most, of my, most of my amateur fights and most of my career have all, all been at welterweight. I have taken, like, three fights at middleweight, obviously events against Maddie, and then two when I was an a amateur. But they, they're just a little too big for me. How, how, do, you feel at, how do you feel at uh, welterweight? I'm sorry, at uh, middleweight? I feel slow, and, and I think it's because... Uh, I, I think the diet down helps to kind of keep me a little bit more fit. Yeah. And I think the, the process of the cut also kind of helps me mentally. You know, just, it just reminds me of the days in high school wrestling and, and just kind of getting in that competitive mode. So and, you, you think you would do well at, uh, at lightweight? You think I you'd... think so, man. I think, I think it's better to fight on an empty stomach, you know. Every time, I'm, every time I, st- I go up a weight class, I feel... I just don't feel as hungry, you know, yeah. and then my, like, I, cause I have to eat so much mm. and I have to like, I just feel slower, you know, like well, there was old, I think I had a jujitsu coach, a Brazilian coach tell me this one time when, uh, I was like 95 kgs yeah. and that's just cause of firefighting, they get, they feed you crap food on the fire line. Yeah. So I would always get big. And then when I come back in the fall to get back into training, it was always heavy. So I'm like trying to get my body back used to it, but I'm not used to being that big. And he's like, yeah. You got a big uh, Cadillac body, but you still small Honda engine. <laughs> Good time to cut down. <laughs> you know, when you get, you know, it's funny, like, to think about going down to lightweight, right? It depends on, you know, what the cut looks like. At least you have a wrestling background. Yeah. So you were pro- you've been probably cutting weight longer than most people even want to think about. Yeah. Seven kgs. If you if you could get to the point where you walk around at welterweight, it's not a horrible cut. It's not that horrible of a cut, and I mean, being at eighty now yeah. or eighty one, depending on how I'm feeling, it's I feel good. Mm. And I think you know, with just a little bit more moderation in my diet, I think I can make that cut down to seventy seven a little bit easier, and then yeah. cut from there should be no problem. Yeah. Because even in this fight, I still had a little bit of a little bit of fat on me, so I felt like okay, I, I think I can make lightweight easily. Yeah, if you think about like lightweight, I mean, I don't know if it's that weight that you could make on like a week's notice, though. What no, I mean, I think that one would definitely have to be a little bit more. But like I said, I'm gonna definitely try and um, make a test cut and see nice. how I feel. 
Do it, man. Yeah. Be excited. And if not, then I'll be ready for a 77 right away. <laughs> Wh- whoever needs it, call. <laughs> whoever needs it, man, I'm here. Well, man, I hope. Frong, I hope, and Frong needs fights too, man. I'm here out here in Asia. Yeah, I hope Risen calls. I mean, but you know, they don't have a lot of shows, so they don't, man. I mean, Dream, that, Dream, Dream is an option. Road. Yeah, Road. You know, Rebel. Um, Rebel, Rebel, obviously. I think there's a new organization in Australia as well that I saw Jason Ponet fight for. Okay. So I'm gonna try and reach out to them. I think they're called Hex or Hex. Hex or something like that. Hex fighting? Something like I, I gotta look it up. Was but he fighting MMA for them, or was he fighting kickboxing? He fought MMA. Okay. Oh yeah, Hex fight series. Yeah. In Victoria. Yeah. So, so any of those organizations, and I mean that's not a fl- that's not a far flight, you know, I, I, from here from Thailand. Actually, if you were able to get a the the nice thing would be if you could get a fight in Perth. Perth. Right. It's the same. So I don't know if they only do Victoria or if they travel around. But Perth, the whole western part of Australia, is the same time zone as Thailand. No, oh, yeah. So I mean, it's still like a six-hour flight, but you're not time shifting. Yeah, you're yeah. Like t- you you got to fly Air Asia. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, man. So I, I'm definitely gonna try and stay busy. And I mean, yes. if for for some reason the fights don't show up, like I think jujitsu wise, I I I'm I'm gonna focus competitively on that. Nice. You know, we just got a few guys in from uh, Brazil mm. training with us at Elite. One of them's a high-level black belt. Yeah, and just being have have good partners like that, I think I can definitely take improve. The, yeah, take the Asian the grappling scene by storm. Nice, you know. And, but I mean, I understand as a fighter, you want to be able to get fights, you want to be able yeah. to sign somewhere. You know, there, there's limited opportunity. I know we were talking before. You said one's not interested. Maybe, I mean, maybe you, now, maybe because when I came to them, I was only two and zero. Okay. So maybe if I reach out again, they signed Rika at what zero and zero. Yeah, but but I mean the the. The the women's division is not that deep, other you know? dynamics there. Yeah, 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 you know, and the, yeah, there's other dynamics going. But they got that lightweight Grand Prix coming up. Yeah, yeah. That, that that would definitely be an opportunity for sure. Yeah, you know, if they if, if they want, you know, I mean, for being a foreigner and they're saying that I I bring a crowd. If they have a, if they have a thing in Bangkok, I guarantee you, I can get a for ton sure. of people to come and show up. Yeah, they they do a three or four a year here yeah. in Bangkok, so. So, no doubt you got a following. No doubt you move the needle, and they're all about metrics. Yeah. So I mean, you make that case. Maybe it happens. Yeah, exactly. I mean, now I I think also too maybe they're a little hesitant because all my fights ended so quickly, so they didn't really get a chance to see what my game is like. But yeah. hey, man, I can strike as well as uh, submit people. I think this last fight I demonstrated that I I can do the full gamut. I can wrestle. I can grapple. For sure. And you I can strike. You should know? hit up uh, Bashir. Yeah. I ran into him afterwards. I said, hey, man, you let me know. And he's like, all right, just keep bugging me. So I'm going to try and keep a... If he said keep bugging him, keep bugging him because yeah. he, he means it. Like, yeah. One one thing's uh, Bashir, if you, if you know him, if he says do something, like, he means it. Like if he says bother me, bug me, he, he wants you to. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll see now, man. Hopefully yeah. maybe they'll be interested now, now that I have a little bit more of a record, being more four and one. I mean, it's getting into that veteran style. I Especially like. if you tell him you want to go to lightweight and... Right. Yeah, into that Grand Prix. More opportunities for sure. I'm excited for those Grand Prix. I'm excited too, man. I think, I mean, granted, one in the last couple of weeks is definitely stepping it up. I will give him last that. week alone. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm so I'm much doing news, a whole dude. episode about like just last week because there's so much going on. Yeah, so I'll definitely give them that, man. They're they're uh, they're definitely stepping up to the plate, and, All right. and and we're definitely rivaling the UFC. So yeah. there you go, man. Put it on the map. There you go. All right, brother. Well, I'm going to let you get going. All right, man. Thank you so much for having me on, man. Yeah, thanks for coming by. And anytime you want to come by, just yeah, holler absolutely, at me. dude. This is fun. All right. Talk <laughs> to you later, man. All right. Cheers, guys.